Good morning, everybody. God bless. Welcome to Lakeshore Assembly. Praise God. And we're glad you're all here today. Welcome. Um, so we're going to open with a word of prayer, and we're going to get praise in our God. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and praise you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. So, Father, we, we, just, we, we have to just give you our attention and our affection this morning. You are worthy of it. May we now worship you with all our might. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Amen. For those of you that can stand, will you please stand for worship? <laughs> You 
Lord. Praise you, Lord. It cost you everything, but you gave it to us, Lord, and we are so thankful. We are so grateful, Lord. We just give you praise and honor this morning. In Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. Are you ready to waste it all? To pour it all out on the Lord this morning? The, the world calls what we do a waste of time. But God says it is a beautiful, wonderful, awesome thing that we do. It is a sweet incense to him Amen. when we give him praise and worship. And he deserves it all. So this morning, pour everything you got out. Just pour it out to the Lord this morning. Everybody, don't worry about nobody's looking at you. <laughs> we're, we're just paying attention to the Lord this morning. We're not watching each other. In Jesus' name. One, two, three, four. Covered in shame, hiding my face. I hear the dead I could not. Searching in vain to fill my heart I threw my worth away When I thought I was lost You saw me And you came to my defense This priceless gift you gave Was not meant for me to hold I want to waste it all on you I want to pour Holding my face, wiping my endless tears away. You unlock my heart, whispering grace. How could I leave this place? When I'm here at your feet, I can feel you. All the voices fade away. I will spend all my days giving back the love you gave. 
Amen. Give them a praise. Hallelujah. We're going to anoint with oil at this time. The Bible teaches that if any have a affliction or a need, come and be anointed with oil in the name of the Lord. The oil has no uh, mystical properties. It simply represents an anointing. In the Bible, when kings were anointed with oil, and when we anoint with oil, it's, it's talking about the kingship of Jesus Christ, really. So when we come to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and we bring the needs in our lives to him, he hears us when we come to him with a humble heart. So come this morning. If you, if you want to be prayed for personally, stay up around the front. If you want to be anointed and simply go back to your seat, go back to your seat and uh, praise God. You have that option.
ways It's your kindness It's your kindness that leads to repentance It's your blood that brings forgiveness It's your mercy that leads me here To your throne of praise In your kindness in your kindness I find repentance In your blood I find forgiveness In your mercy I find myself In your throne of praise In your throne of praise Down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you. I'd rather be no place I'd rather be 
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Where would I run but to the throne of mercy? Where would I kneel but at this cross of grace? How great the love, how strong the hand that holds us. Beautiful, so beautiful. So here I bow to lift you high, Jesus. Be glorified in all things for all my. King who bore the scars of healing. There is a son who came in grace and truth. How great the love that carries us to kindness. Wonderful, you're wonderful. So he
So here I bow. So here I bow to lift you high. Jesus, be glorified in all things. For all my life, I am yours, forever yours. God here. offers us an invitation that's to come into his house to come into his family to be a part of something bigger than us to be a part of heaven in itself to be a part of God's family you know I don't know about you but there's not too many people that want to invite you in these days to be a part of their family and God Thank you so much for inviting each and every person to, to come into your family. Whether we accept the invitation or not, that's up to us. But you've invited. Thank you. So this morning, if you feel like you're weak and you can't stand and you're not the best and you're not perfect, well, then get a ticket and get in line because that's where all the rest of us are at. And God does not ask us to be perfect. He just asks us to be a part of his family. And that we're forgiven. In Jesus' name, Lord, save those that need to be saved. Heal those that need to be healed this day. Bring those in to comfort them and cover them with your spirit. Lord, call us in Jesus' name. Go. 
Um, I'm just going to take just a, a few moments here, but during worship, the Holy Spirit was just speaking to me, and uh, that the word that uh, our sister shared with us that, um, yes, you, you need to know how much God really loves you, and, and you need to know that he wants to prepare you for things that are in our future, you know? So right now there's so much going on around us. There's so much swirling going on around us and we're hearing all sorts of things from all sorts of sources. But the Lord wants you to hear from him. And, and, you, and you need to really take seriously how much he loves you and how much he wants you to be in his word, to be praying, to be seeking him. Because, you know, it, 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 it's, well, we know it's in the word. Things are not going to get better. <laughs> Things are going to escalate. And so the Holy Spirit just wanted me to just impress upon you that when the Lord speaks a word to us, he really wants us to consider it. Seriously, you know, don't blow it off <laughs> because it's important. You know, he, he wants you to take it seriously. And, and, and it's all about how much he loves you. And he wants you to make it through, you know, because it's a war. You know, it's a war. And he wants you to have victory yeah. and the freedom. Yeah. And he wants you to make it through. So trust him. And believe him. You know, we're in a battle, but we have the victory, right? We know how the story ends, right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. I wanted uh, Noel to share. Wow. In the beginning, okay. Uh, you know, we're always looking for ways to share the love of Christ, and Noel always comes up with some strange but cool ways to share the gospel. And she shared something with us the other day at, at, uh, when we got together at our house. Just take a minute to share what you've been doing. Yeah, there you go. Uh -oh. uh, real quick, um, I'm, I know Jesus has saved my life. I'm not going to, you know. Yeah. If it wasn't for him, I would be in the pit. But anyway, he puts urges to visit Dennis and Trudy in the hospital, try to cook something for Bob, all, all these urges. And recently, I, I'm not the person that knows all the scriptures, but I got the urge that I travel on Lake Trent, I go out, and I got these notes at Hobby Lobby, and I found small scriptures that are encouraging because a lot of people out there is getting crazy. Anyway, so I go out in the bus, I write a scripture down, and I give it to people, whoever they are. And I, he wanted me to touch on a few. A Lake Trend driver, she was driving a single bus, and I gave her the note. I didn't even get on the bus, I just said, here. She smiled, she read it, and she knew it. She smiled, I was getting off, and she was still saying thank you. And um, the first two men I got at the bus stop, the um, one man couldn't read too well, and he said, pray, pray for others. And so um, one lady who um, was doing something for me for my apartment complex, her daughter is 30 years old and she has serious seizures. And it, she was just telling me it's hard to take as a mother. Anyway, she was doing something for me and I had my purse with me and I handed her a scripture because she was going to visit her daughter. And I bring these stones that I got at Hobby Lobby, and I always give that one too. Because the stone was rolled away, I gave it to this lady. As soon as she saw it, it was meant to be because she said, that's one of my, fav my daughter's favorite scriptures. And she was just like, thank you. And so I just hand these out whenever, once or twice a week I go out. This is one of them. Cast all your anxiety on him. He cares for you. P. 
Peter 5-7. God bless. There, that's what I'm doing. Amen. Jeff? Another brother wanted to just share a testimony, give God some praise. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff. Uh, I started attending church here, I think it was end of July, beginning of August of this past year. Uh, wonderful friends had introduced me to this church, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, a lot of things, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm not really good at talking in front of people, but I'm giving this my best shot here. Um, you know, I've uh, been through a lot of my life, as much of us have in our own ways. Uh, I've had a lot of things that I had pushed God away in my life, and um, it was probably one of the worst things I've ever done. <laughs> uh, and about five years ago, uh, actually July of this year, I, my mom will be gone five years. She had unexpected brain cancer. And I was in a room with her when she passed and at the hospital. And ever since then, uh, I've had a lot of blessings come in my life since my mom's been gone. And, uh, you know, I had uh, moved out. I actually went through bariatric surgery back in October of this year. I lost a lot of weight and stuff. And that was a big trial period for me in my life and my health. And I'm glad to be here today because if I didn't get that done and have the God by my side, I probably wouldn't be here because of health issues. You know, and I had moved away. Uh, I went to Florida, Pensacola. Uh, I had some friends that uh, were going through some really rough times with the hurricane down there. And uh, a tree almost fell and almost killed them in a house. And uh, I went down there and helped them and got them into another house. And I ended up coming back here uh, in February of this year. And I just started uh, attending back here at church. And, you know, uh, basically what I'm trying to say is, you know, without God in my life, you know, and uh, it's not always about attending church, but saying prayers at home and being part of the Christian life and, and just being there and accepting him into your life uh, has made a big difference and miracles happen in my life. So I just wanted to share that with everyone a little bit. And, uh, and thank you for letting me share that, Pastor. Thank you. Thanks, bro. Amen. Praise God. Welcome to Lakeshore. Uh, Pro-Life members, uh, we had 16 delegates that we took to a pro-life conference yesterday at uh, um, a church in uh, uh, Leroy Community Chapel. And uh, praise God, we had a wonderful time. And um, I had an idea this morning in July. Uh, we're, we're not going to have two men's groups during the summer. We're only going to have it the first Wednesday in June, July, and August because the car show is the last Wednesday. So I didn't want to double up every single Wednesday, but what we're going to do in the middle of July is have a pro-life conference right here. So uh, I want every member of this church to be here. We're going to be getting some of the speakers that we heard yesterday. We're going to have a pro-life rally here, and we're going to get the word out, and it's going to be a blast. I can hardly wait to do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We also have some pro-life literature. There's uh, uh, the, the pro-deathers are trying to get an amendment put on the Constitution of the Ohio State that would completely negate any restriction and any laws that have ever been passed in any way, shape, or form against abortion. It would abolish every single uh, prohibition of abortion that's in any law book in Ohio. It would completely open us up. We would be worse in California if this bill passes. So there's some information out on the thing, but uh, so I'll, I'll be in touch with you as to the information about the rally that we're going to be doing. Last Wednesday, right here, we had an unbelievable missionary, uh, Zach Zobias. He was amazing, and we had an unbelievable crowd here again, as you can see. And praise God, we had another giant missions offering, and uh, it was uh, ended up to be uh, $891. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> praise God. And we gave it all to him. Now, the next men's group 
is going to be Wednesday, May 3rd, amen, and we're going to have million dollar chicken casserole, hallelujah, amen, and I think that's a million dollars, I asked for a million dollars in Google, we'll see, hallelujah, it better be good is all I've got to say, all right, right, is it going to be good, is it going to be worth a million dollars, it's going to taste like a million, okay, amen, amen, prayer meeting this Tuesday right here at 645, prayer meeting, and this Wednesday, uh, in the fellowship hall, we continue with our Bible study through the book of Romans. Thursday morning, we're going to be having at 8.30 a.m. at my home on Newell Street in Painesville. We're doing a verse-by-verse, -verse, uh, and we have, uh, how many guys have ever been to the study? Raise your hands. You've been to the study before. We have a lot of men that are coming. We're, get, we're back in the garage. The weather is good enough that we can be back into the garage and we're doing the book of Proverbs. So men, we'll see you there. Now this Thursday night, I had scheduled a movie night. If we have a movie here on Thursday night, how many will try to come? Raise your hands if you'll try to come. Okay, we'll do it. All right, amen. I haven't picked out a movie yet, so you'll just have to come and see how good it's going to be, all right? Hallelujah, amen. So this Thursday night, 6.30 sharp, we're going to have movie night with some snacks. It's going to be a lot of fun, okay? The name of the message today is Third Times a Charm. Now remember, after Jesus rose again from the dead, as the messages have been centered around uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the last few weeks, we've been talking about what happens after Jesus rises from the dead. What is the dimension that is taking place with the apostles? And last week, we talked about the doubter. And of course, the doubter is found in John 20, 24, 29. We're not going to go there, but I'm just recapping a little bit. And of course, we know what Thomas did. He said, if I, uh, if I, don't, if I can't thrust my hand into his side and touch his wounds, I will not really believe that he's risen from the dead. And we know what Jesus did. Hallelujah. He just appeared uh, in, a, in a locked room. There he was. Uh, like I said last week, beam me up, Scotty, hallelujah. And there was Jesus standing among them. And of course, Thomas then believed and said, my Lord and my God. And remember what the Lord said, blessed are those that have seen and believe. But more blessed are those that have not seen and yet believe. And as much as we say to ourselves, boy, if I was there, it'd be so awesome to see the Lord risen from the dead. The Bible says you are more blessed that you have not physically seen him yet, but yet you believe. So we got we to gotta understand that. Hallelujah. Then, of course, we had uh, the fisher. I'm talking about, of course, Peter, John 20, 24 to 29, and the other apostles. And what's interesting, obviously, is uh, we see that they, they went fishing. And you remember what happened. They, they were fishing all night, didn't catch anything. And then Jesus is on the shore and he's probably, uh, there's probably more distance than we think. There's, it's probably not like 50, 100 feet. Uh, the boat might have been out hundreds of feet. But when Jesus shouted from the shoreline, uh, have you caught anything? And, and he says, no, we've been fishing all night. We got nothing. And we know what, what Jesus said, something really intelligent, smart. Just throw the net on the other side. So literally the distance in between from one side of the boat to the other. If you simply put the nets from that side to this side, you'll catch some fish. Now, to Peter's credit, he does it. Sometimes something crazy works. Amen? And we know what happened, okay? So what's, what's interesting, in a matter of hours, Peter had, and we know what happened, that that. In a matter of hours, Peter experienced the greatest failure and the greatest success because his greatest failure was that he had fished all night and caught absolutely nothing. I'll, I'll bet you if you could ask Peter, Peter, have, have you ever had another night where you fished all night with other people that were also fishermen and caught nothing, not one fish? I'll bet you he would tell you, no, that, that first time that ever happened was this. Okay, an empty net. But then his greatest success that he ever experienced, okay, was the morning that he caught absolutely everything. 
So one night he catches nothing, and the next morning he catches everything. Literally within minutes of each other, we go from the greatest failure that this fisherman has ever had to the greatest success that he has ever had. No matter how proficient Peter had been all his life, both extremes were not by his own hand. And that's important because the Lord was showing Peter that he has supremacy. Amen? Jesus demonstrated his supremacy over the nature of even the fish kingdom. Because it was the Lord that told the fish to stay away. Then it was the Lord that told the fish, come on back. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Arthur Treacher's could use the Lord here. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And, and what, so he demonstrated his supremacy over the nature of the fish kingdom to entice Peter to trust his supremacy over an eternal kingdom. And that's what we need to understand is that sometimes God takes things in the natural to demonstrate his power. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and sometimes that it, there can even be a lack of something in this world to demonstrate his power. There are times that, that when you have had the least of the things of this world, you have experienced maybe the greatest dimension of the presence of God in your life. Amen. Amen. Sometimes when your heart has been the most broken, you have had the most palatable sense of the presence of God in your heart. So we, we often think that if everything is just right, I, I, everything will be just right with God. And yet to be fair with the Lord, that if, if push comes to shove and you are to write down the times in your life that God has been the, in your concept and your understanding the closest Trust me when I tell you it probably wasn't when everything was perfect. It was probably when everything was opposite of it. And the Lord does that because understand his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. We are so bound by this world. Isn't it true? We're so bound by gravity. Gravity is taking its toll on us. Amen? Hallelujah. The, when you get up in the morning, it's gravity. That, that, that helps you not get up as fast as you should. When you watch the news, it is the weight of this world is overwhelming. We are, over, we are swimming in, in, in not just negative, it's not even negativity. It is the reality of, of the world systems that are taking place. And, 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 and this is not a good time right now in this world. But, but understand, Jesus said in this world, he did make a promise. In this world, you'll have tribulation. That's what Jesus promised. So, so when you see some of the big box people talking about that you're to be happy, you're to be wealthy, you're to be beautiful, you're, you're, you're to be the winner, you're to be this, you're to be that, understand that that's 99% not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because an unbeliever can buy that. I mean, yeah, oh, great, okay, I'll be rich, I'll be famous, I'll be this, I'll be that. The, not that the Lord doesn't use people. And understand, the Lord is allowed to make people rich if he wants to. Uh, how, do you, how do you handle, you know, because some Christians believe that poverty, God wants us all to be in poverty, then how do you handle most of the Old Testament? Because every other person in the Old Testament was rich by God. Abraham was one of the richest people that ever lived by God. Solomon was one of the richest. Joseph, Joseph was rich. All King David was rich. All these people, many of them were wealthy. Job had everything, lost everything, and then God gave him two, three times as much. So God is allowed to prosper those. And remember, the foundation, in my opinion, of biblical prosperity is that you're allowed to probably own anything that doesn't own you. But you find somebody that will get owned by something, they can have something almost worth, not worth anything. And yet if it owns them, they're not allowed to have anything else. So don't be bitter towards people that have more than you, because deep down it really doesn't matter. And, and just be glad that you don't have the liability and the expense that other people have that used to be jealous of. Amen? Used to drive through a neighbor, oh, I wish we had that house. Now you drive through, it's like, man, am I glad we don't have that house. <laughs> Amen? Things change as you grow in the Lord. And, and you start to realize that the things of the greatest value are not really 
made of mortar and metal. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Now we're going to talk about Peter. And we know what he did in John 18, 15 through 17. Open your Bibles if you would. And I'm going to ask the worship team at 20 after, just come up here. Don't wait for me to give you the cue, Patty. Just 20 after on the dot. Team, come on back up. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because his disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You! You're one of his disciples too! Aren't you? Are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. Now, we know that as we talk about Peter denying the Lord three times, we need to understand, I believe everything in the Bible is there for a reason. How many believe that? I don't think anything's in there by accident. So when we read John, the 21st chapter, we, and, and we're going to be looking at Peter getting reinstated. Getting reinstated from what? Well, he's getting reinstated from this. So he denies the Lord three times, okay, but this is the first time, and he's warming his hand at the enemy's fire. There's a sermon there. i got to work on a sermon because there's, there's a sermon there. Because there's times in life that we honestly think that we will comfort ourselves at the enemy's fire. We honestly think that that God can't give me comfort, God can't be the answer, so I'm going to go back to this habit, or I'm going to go back to this toxic relationship or something. And, and, and it's sad because, because people that come out of, of terrible situations, I've read stories of women that were abused by boyfriends and husbands, and then they finally had a guy that didn't abuse them, and, and they didn't know how to handle it. And sometimes they go back to the abuse because it's more familiar. Because there's times there's a level of drama that takes place and there's adrenaline that happens when, when there's trouble and, and, and when there's, there's, there's impending tragedy. And, and there's times that we can become a junkie almost to that. And, and, and we have to learn almost how to have peace. We're so used to not having peace that when we have it, we're not sure what to do. The world is just, it, it's, it's discipling us in hostility. It's discipling us in, in manicness. It's discipling us in being freaked out all the time and aggravated and upset at all the other people groups. And Jesus said, I came to, that you would have peace. I came so that, that you, you would be set free from that bondage. So Peter goes on, and he denies the Lord, obviously, Two more times. So he denied the Lord three times. Not once, not twice, not three times. And we know the story. The back story is that, that Peter was the one just a few hours earlier. What did he tell the Lord? If everybody else denies you, not me, not me. If everybody else coughs you up, I won't. If nobody else supports you, I will. And we know what happened. We know what happened. In the garden, he pulls out a sword. He wanted to become a Middle East terrorist. He wanted to die. He wanted to die to prove to Jesus that his word was good. Jesus already told him, you're going to deny me. And before this night's through, you're going to hear the rooster crow. And Peter didn't like that. Has anybody ever told you something that's true and you don't want to hear it? How'd you react? I'm just saying. So he tells Peter this. Peter says, no, I'll, I'll, I'll defend you. And all the other apostles said the same. We always need to remember, Peter was the voice for the apostles. So when he would be impulsive and say something kind of stupid, they all then agreed with him. <laughs> so poor Peter, he's always in trouble. He's impulsive, but they usually back him up. So when he told Jesus, 
I'll, I'll die for you if I have to. Then the Bible says, and the others said the same. But he's the one who voiced it. Then in the garden, I'm going to prove it. Here comes the guards. Pulls out that sword, cuts off Malchus's ear. <laughs> okay? And he knew the minute he drew that sword, he knew. It's, it's no different. Watch YouTube. Find anybody that pulls a gun, and there's several policemen, and they say, drop it, drop it, drop it. If they don't drop that weapon, okay, they're going to be dead in the next 20 seconds, next five seconds, right? Peter knew the same thing. He knew when he took that sword out. He knew when he cocked it back, and trust me, he wasn't aiming for the ear. And what does Jesus do? Messes up a perfect situation for Peter. He picks up the ear, puts it back, and the guy heals it. Heals it. Cuts the ear off. He puts it right back on. It's healed. And then he rebukes Peter. Peter, Peter just tried to give his life for Christ. Christ wasn't having it. You see, sometimes when you want to give a sacrifice, it can't be on your terms. It has to be on his. Peter's sacrifice could not be received. Okay. Oh, man, then he heard something in the distance. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. So then Jesus rises again, right? They see him. You know what I'm saying? The apostles have already been around the risen Christ. And so... Let's look at the first time of his reinstatement, John 21, 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, and let me, something's, something, we had a malfunction in the system here, so don't be mad, I'm going to go back, because there was a whole line of reasoning I wanted to share with you. Okay, good. John 21, 15. Let's open our Bibles. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now, the Lord is gracious to Peter because Peter denied the Lord three times. He's going to give Peter three times to say something different. Then I don't know him. Because there's times that we can say something hard to someone else. But thank God for the mercy that we receive from the Lord and sometimes from other people. So that we're able to say something that is more pure from our heart than it was previous. Amen? Has anybody ever gotten in trouble with somebody by saying something stupid? Anybody? Any takers? Okay, is there anybody here that's, that's never happened? Any fakers? Okay. So, so he calls them, and, and this is weird because, and, and at first this looks kind of mean because he says, Simon, son of John. Well, wait a minute. That wasn't his name anymore. Jesus refers to Peter in his previous title, before, before. He was given a new title. Remember in, in, in the Bible, there were Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. There were people that, that when they were called and set apart, God gave them a new name. Hallelujah. And the Bible says there's a new name written down in glory. Hallelujah for us. Did you know that there's a name in heaven for each and every one of you that you don't know yet, but you'll find out when you get there? Hallelujah. That's going to be pretty cool. John 1.42, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will now be called Cephas, which is interpreted Peter. Hallelujah. So by referring him as son of John, it was almost not nice. 
it's almost like Simon, well, in a way, here's what the Lord's doing. He's, he's going back to the beginning. Sometimes you got to go back to the beginning. Sometimes you got to get back to the as simplest spot as you can find. Because life can get so complicated. And, and it can get so unraveled. And often we have to go back to the same place, that same spot that we thought we'd never have to go back to. Or that simplicity that we thought, I'm beyond that. I'm more mature than that. I don't need that. Oh, yeah, sometimes you do. Sometimes you, you got to go back. So then Jesus said this. Okay, do you love me more than these? What are these? The other apostles, the fishermen, or fishing in general? Because obviously when he said to Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter's looking around and he's probably saying, yeah, I love you more than fishing. I love you more than fishermen. I love you more than maybe the other apostles. Okay? Now, all of us have experiences. And I'm going to share one to those of you that have heard it before. It's a repeat. I remember my grandfather used to have a shoe repair shop in Painesville at the same time my dad had one. And my brother Mark, when he was a little kid, he'd go to grandpa's every day after school at St. Mary's. We'd pick him up. I remember we'd pick him up after we worked at the other shop in Painesville. And we'd say, how's grandpa doing today? And Mark would go, pretty good. Did he tell any stories today? Yeah, he told a lot of stories. Every customer who came in, people told me, if I went to see grandpa, I never went in unless I had 10, 12 minutes to spare. Because every time people went in there, Grandpa would tell stories. Did you, what were the stories today? They were all repeats, Dad. Amen. So I'm going to repeat. This is the line in the middle of the road. Amen. If you're going to do something for God, you're going you're to end up on the line in the middle of the road. Because you've got to make a choice to make it not like the chicken, but forget the chicken. But you're starting from some place, and you're going to have to cross something to get to something else. Amen? And this is not a picture of our shoe repair, but I found a shoe repair shop, put my name on it. And I was at the, I was at the shoe shop one day, and uh, across the street was Angelo's Pizza. How many remember Angelo's Pizza in Painesville? He had good pizza. So I used to run across the street. The shop was right across the street. It didn't even lock the door because I could see the shop from the pizza shop. Run in, get a coffee, and run back to the shoe shop, okay? And Donna knew that if she ever saw me running across, just pour, get the coffee in the cup and just put it there. Sometimes I'd pay it for it later. Hallelujah. So I feel like I want a cup of coffee. It's middle of the afternoon. And I step out. And I noticed when I went to cross, it was strange because it was the middle of the day and I looked left, left and right and not one car was moving anywhere. I didn't see one car moving. So the road was completely empty, which I remember it struck me like, wow, no traffic. So I step out into the middle of the road and then all of the sudden, okay, I'm stepping out in the middle of the road, praise God, and what happened was, I, I'm on the middle line, and for some reason, it was the weirdest thing. I stopped, turned around, and I looked at the shoe shop, a shop that my dad was going to leave me. It was mine. He told me, it's yours. And I'll never forget, I turned around, looked at the shoe shop. The glory of Porstowski Shoe Service. It was my business, my family, my heritage, our heritage in Painesville. And I remember God telling me, You're gonna leave, you have to leave this. He spoke to my heart and he told me without any, this, this day, this time is going to cease. It's going to be different. It didn't happen right away, but but I knew that I knew that I knew that it's going to be time finally to leave this behind. Whether my dad likes it or not, because I went to my dad, told him someday I'm going to go full time. And 
and everything, and my dad wasn't buying it, okay? He didn't believe that I would really leave the shoe shop, the family business, to become a pastor. And I remember I looked at the shoe shop, turned around, and I was, I was weeping. I literally started weeping. You know, when you, when you leave something that's precious, there's, there's a, there can be grieving that goes on. Anybody ever go through that? You, you can leave a situation, you can leave a job, you can leave uh, might, a, a place that you live to somewhere else, and there, there might be grief. In my case, I was grieving because from the age of four, I was working in that shop with my dad, and, and now it's hitting me like, I'm going to have to leave this. So I'm crying, and I walk in to the pizza shop, and I'm weeping, and Donna goes, Jim, are you okay? Yeah. What's wrong? Well, God just told me something. She goes, okay, here's your coffee. And I turned around, went back to the shop. From that minute on, it was never the same for me. I knew that the trajectory of my life had to go in a different direction. If you're going to serve God, if you're going to do something for God, if you're called, when I say called, I don't just mean called into, quote, the ministry, because all of you are called, quote, to ministry. Amen? So if you're called, you've got to be called away from one thing because you've got to be on your way to something else. And the, the, to be honest with you, the evidence that you're really stepping forward in what God's called you to do, no matter what, how simple no matter how big or small it appears to be to anybody in this world. The proof is that if nothing is in the rearview mirror, you haven't left yet. So when I went into that pizza shop, the shop was in my rearview mirror now. And that never changed. That was probably 36 years ago, that that experience happened. And it's never been the same since. We all have that line in the sand or in the middle of the road. Because no matter what God tells you to do, it could be the simplest thing. you got to leave something to something else. If God tells you to take some money out of the bank and bless somebody, that then you, there's got to be evidence of that. There's going to be a less number in your bank account because you blessed somebody. If God tells you that you've got to take a day and sacrifice, a mom's sacrifice to stay home and, and teach your kids instead of having a job where you can make a lot more money and drive a newer car, if that's the sacrifice you make because the Lord shows you to do that, then there's going to be evidence of that sacrifice. If God tells you that, that, that you're going to uh, serve so somewhere in the church and, and you've got to get up earlier on Sunday morning to get here early to, to do stuff, you're going to be in the worship team and you've got to be here before 9 in the morning, then, then, then that's going to be the sacrifice. The evidence is going to be the car out of your driveway an hour earlier than it used to be. Whatever it is you're going to do for God, there's going to be, there has to be something that you left to get where you're going. John 15, 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And I like this. So that whatsoever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And, and, and if, you, if you are young and still have a level of carnality in your life because we, we can, you can be 100% saved. You can even be filled with spirit and still we struggle with carnality. How many struggle sometimes with carnality? Yeah. Okay. You, you can read a verse like this and you can say that means that anything I want, God has to give me. So what is, what is God? He's, He's deposed to a giant cosmic candy machine. But, but as you get deeper in the Lord, you realize that whatever you ask in his name, you learn what is God's actual will. Because sometimes the will of God will make you a loser. 
not a winner. I knew a guy, he worked on a, a crew in Cleveland and, and his boss and all the guys and things, they'd go to Pinkies on West 150th. There was a nude uh, dancing bar and the boss would take the guys and they would always invite this other guy. And he was a Christian, he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go. They'd mock him, they'd laugh at him. And, and uh, the other guys were getting raises uh, the, the, they would give this guy the worst jobs. Jobs that they would hire guys and pay a minimum wage. And, and they would take the minimum wage guys and they'd do the easier jobs. They'd take the worst, filthiest jobs and they'd give it to this guy. Why? Because he's not going to do what the boss wants. And he's not talking about working on the job. He's talking about... So because he was a Christian, he looked like a loser. He looked like a loser. He'd go to work. He didn't enjoy work at all. People were mean to him. The boss was mean to him. But he was holding the line. So sometimes the sacrifice. So he could ask, whatever you ask in my name, Father, I will do. And, and, and here's what he told me, because I remember he told me. He says, I was so upset and bitter. And then I changed it. I said, you know, God, I want to show them that somebody loves God. I, I, if nobody else in this world is going to be an example of, of Christ, I'm going to try to be that example. Eventually, the boss let him go. But, but when he left, he knew that he had shown a proper representation of the holiness of God. Amen? So he looked like a loser, but he was the winner. Amen? Saved to serve. Hallelujah. You're saved to serve. Everybody here is saved to serve. You're saved to do something. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how small it is. There ain't nobody here that ain't saved to do something. When people say, I can't do anything, that's a lie. <laughs> Everybody's got time, energy. You've got time, talent, and treasure. Every single person here can do something. It doesn't matter how simple it is. It doesn't matter how big it is. It, we're not judging it by what the world thinks. We're judging it from obedience from the heart. The second time. John 21, 16. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Jesus said. Take care of my sheep. So we notice here that he's saying, take care of the sheep. Why? Because Peter is going to be, hallelujah, he's going to be one of the foundational people of the Christian church. A loser like Peter is going to become one of the key pillars of the Christian church. Then there's the third time. John 21, 17. Third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Three times Peter denied the Lord. Three times Peter said, I love you, Lord. Amen? Peter is now restored. Amen. Amen. Peter's restored. And if you've never experienced restoration, try it. Try it. Pick somebody that you think hates you or you hate or whatever. Go to them. Get it restored. If they don't want to be restored to you, it doesn't matter. If, if i got to be honest. When it comes to restoration, it doesn't matter if, if they want to be restored to you, but you have to have the heart to be restored to them. See, because we say, well, I'm not going to them because I know they don't want to come to me. Well, the Bible says put down your gift and go to that person. Try to get it straightened out. Restoration is a good thing. And nine, I'll be honest, nine out of ten times in life, things will probably go pretty good. But you've got to go for the right attitude. You, you can't go like a little notch on the piece of wood. Oh, look what I'm doing for God. No, you have to, you have to go in humility and, and everybody in the world doesn't have to know the good thing that you just did. And that's hard because sometimes, you know, we, we, wanna, we, want, we want to be stroked. You know, we want to feel really good about something good that we did. That's, there's a part of, that's, that's good, but there's a part of that we have to even balance that out. We have to discern that. So Peter's restored. But then in 2118, just to show you that Peter really is restored, then Jesus 
levels this on Peter. Listen what he says. He says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Now, the terminology is interesting. Now, I don't know if Jesus meant it the way it sounded, but I believe he probably did. But this is what we know, that Peter, when they crucified him for his faith in Christ, he said, I am not worthy to die the way my Savior died. So they crucified Peter upside down. So when Jesus said, you will put your hand, you'll stretch your hands out, it was for a cross in his future. I can't think of being restored more than that. Then Christ would communicate to Peter, you're going to suffer for me. Very thing in America Christians are afraid of. But other parts of the world, you know, in, in Cambodia, Vietnam, the Assemblies of God, did you know there's like, I think there's six countries in the world that if you go to get credentials to be a pastor or an evangelist in those countries, do you know what are the first things you have to prove? You have to show the wounds in your body that you've already suffered for your testimony in Christ. Because if you don't have any wounds, then you're not for real. If you haven't been tortured a little bit, you're not authentic. Can you imagine in America? I'm serious, if every one of you you knew today, if you pull in this parking lot, you're gonna be in trouble with the government, which someday, the way this government's going, we already are in trouble with the government, okay? But just understand what I'm saying. If you knew that you knew that you knew that just coming into this driveway, you're gonna be in some kind of trouble. How many would be missing here today? If you knew that they're going to go after your bank account unless you confess against Christ. I, I'm not trying to shame us. We, we live in a bubble here. I've said that all my ministry. Men is a bubble. Thank God it's a bubble the way it is. I, we like that. But understand what I'm saying. There's people all around us suffering in ways that we cannot even imagine for Christ. Peter was told as soon as he was restored, you will suffer for me. Peter accepted the terms of that engagement. Amen? Why don't we stand as we close in a song here, and we'll close in prayer in a minute. Jesus, before you all secrets are known, before you all thoughts are exposed, and nothing is hidden from you, and nothing is hidden from you. Before you my heart is laid bare And you know my every desire You see me and you know my heart You see me and you know my heart Have your way to be 
pleasing unto you. anyone here this morning you would say pastor jim i'm as you preached about that line and i gotta cross a line there's things the lord has placed in my heart some of you may have literal callings upon you but all of you have something that the lord has impressed and you say pastor jim i i want to step over that line i, I want to look back at where i was and I now want that to be in my rearview mirror. Raise your hand and say, that's me. Amen. Amen. Is anyone here you would say, Pastor Jim, I need to commit my life to Christ today. I need to commit my life to Christ today. Jeff didn't share it, but when he visited our church last fall, he grew up a Catholic, and I did too. And he even told me some of his family members were, were wondering if he'd go in the priesthood. He's, he's always had an affection technically for the Lord. So he's always, all his life, he's, he's tried to love Jesus. But when he came here, he found out that, that he could step over that, that line of simply knowing about God, and he could accept Jesus and know him and, and have that rebirth experience. If, if that's you this morning and you need to be born again of the Spirit, you need to know that you know that you know that you know God. Because if you don't really know him, then you can't say you do. <laughs> Amen? If you didn't see it, you didn't. But if you see it, once you see it, you can never say you didn't. Amen? If that's you, raise your hand and say, Pastor Jim, I'm ready to commit my life to Christ. You all may be right with God. That's, that's up to you. Anyone else? Amen. Anyone else? Sister there. Amen. Right around the corner there. Praise God. If you want to pray with her, praise God. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Kathy, if you want to come on over. Kathy and your husband, Nelson, come on over here. Father, we ask in Jesus' name for these three. Help them confirm in their hearts, Lord, that they know you. Something that we can't do by psychology. We can't even do by desire. It is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, when you come into the heart, you send your Holy Spirit. So we're not alone. So it's not just something we believe in our minds. It now is something that we now encase in our heart. Your presence. The Bible says that you give us your Holy Spirit in our hearts. 
Lord, is a sign. It's, it's an evidence <laughs> that this has really happened. I really believe. So, Father, I give you the praise and glory for these three. Bless them mightily in Jesus' precious name. Lord, I pray that this week that supernatural things are going to happen in their hearts and their lives. Lord, let them see, begin to learn to see through that, that prism of what you see, to feel what you feel, God, to know even the things that you know which you are willing to show us. You, reveal, you, you said in your word, Lord, that you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You're not just servants. You're my friends. And I love the fact that we are allowed to be friends of God. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God, amen. Praise God, give God a praise, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Whew, glory to God. Well, get out of here and serve the Lord, okay? Get out in that harvest field. Praise God. Thank you for coming today.